The Atlanta Braves enter 2024 once again, one of the best teams in baseball and the team to beat in the National League East. But will those expectations lead them back to the World Series? We're all going to find out together as we embark on that long journey, which begins just under a month from now when the Braves and the rest of baseball report for spring training. Welcome into BPTV alongside Chris Willis. As always, I'm Grant McCauley. Go ahead, hit that like button for this episode and subscribe if you haven't done that already to the channel. We appreciate your support. and we got a lot of Braves to talk here in 2024. On this episode, we're going to begin our positional preview series. We're going to take a deep dive into each of the main groups for the Braves and look at the National League East as a whole. Chris, though, uh, first and foremost, I don't want to bury the lead here, but it won't be too long until the Braves are down there in Northport doing baseball-type things. Yeah, it's unbelievable. We're almost to the uh, end of January. Uh, uh, pitchers and catchers report uh, right around, what is it, right around February 14th. February 14th. Uh, workout, workout dates are out there. Man, I'm ready for it. it it's going to be here before we know it. It will. we got a lot of ground to cover between now and then. And of course, when we get to spring training, we're going to have all kinds of great coverage for you. I'm going to be down there for Sports Radio 92.9 The Game and all of the many outlets in which I talk about the Atlanta Braves and not limited and including, of course, battery power on that list pretty high up on my depth chart. But we'll put all that aside. I'm going to remain very busy talking about the Atlanta Braves, and we're glad that you're here with us. And we're going to start this positional preview series by taking a look at Atlanta's rotation. And now that it appears most, if not all, of those pieces are in place, after the recent trade for Chris Sale, we look at a talented group. It's led by Spencer Strider and Max Fried. It's backed up by veterans like Sale and Charlie Morton, and there are a lot of options to finish off that starting five as well. Why don't we start with Spencer Strider, though, because he was the driving force of the rotation last season. While Atlanta navigated a lot of injuries and uncertainty, all Strider did was go out there every fifth day and post, and he posted some serious numbers, which were a little bit enigmatic at times, but also made him one of the best pitchers in all of baseball. He led MLB and set a modern Braves record with 281 strikeouts. He was the majors' only 20-game winner and just the eighth Atlanta pitcher to do that, and he's the fourth Braves pitcher to do it in the last 25 years, though oddly enough, back-to-back -back seasons with Kyle Wright and Spencer Strider. Strider, though, is ERA just under four at 3.86, which I think, Chris, leads some folks to question his status among the game's elite, which is a different and somewhat silly debate for another time. Strider, though, he led the league with a 285 fielding independent pitching, and that was even a full run higher than it was for him in 2022. What we have here is not only a fiery competitor with some of the best strikeout stuff in the game, but also a pitcher who expects even more of himself. So, Chris, I say all that to say I'm fascinated to see Strider's evolution year over year. How about you? Yeah, and I mean, it's hard to believe that that was his first full season in the majors. I mean, he, he accomplished a, a ton last year. The ERA got up a little high, as you mentioned. Uh, but, you know, when you looked at the expected stats and, and the peripherals, everything was right in line. I almost feel like he's a little underrated at this point. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe even by his own fan base a little bit. Um, you know, I to just feel I feel like if you and I were sitting here, if he had approached his 309 expected ERA, I think we're sitting here talking about a Cy Young winner yeah. uh, last year. And I, I really believe that probably would have been the case. It's, it's, you know, we should be far enough now that we can look beyond ERA. But I think that's still you know, uh, just a, a factor in, in all the award votings. But I mean, I said this all see off season, we were talking about, um, I know we're going to talk about Max Fried here in a minute, but you know, it was the Braves needed a starter and, and all this talk. But I mean, when you can start a rotation with Spencer Strider and Max Fried, mm -hmm. you're already in a, in pretty good shape. Yeah. A lot of clubs would like to be in that shape and to have both a strikeout generating right-hander like Spencer Strider, and also one of the game's best left-handers in Max Fried, who we'll get to in just a moment. I think if anything with Strider, I mean, there's a couple things that spring to mind that may have folks underrating him or maybe just not properly rating him. Let me put it that way. The home run he gave up in the 2022 NLDS. I think some folks, especially the opposing fan base and particularly Phillies fans, like to point to that one. Mets fans, uh, they have had a little bit of success against Spencer Strider has their team. But I think that that's going to probably normalize in the future here, just based on Strider's potentially uh, dynamite season that he can put up each and every year. But putting all that aside, the home run ball did come at times and seemed like to me, Chris, it ruined a handful, if not more starts for Spencer Strider, where he's cruising right along. Looks like he's going to be able to go six, seven strong innings, maybe strike out a dozen. All of a sudden, a three-run homer makes that whole line look different. But I can't take away from the fact that with a 20-game winner like Spencer Strider, clearly the Braves were doing a lot more winning with him on the mound than not. Absolutely. And, and you and I both know how much of a hard worker he is. I mean, he's, he's his biggest critic and, uh, and that's, that makes it easy, a whole lot easier to put a lot of confidence in him. You know, we saw the change up last year at times that, that pitch was nasty for him. Yeah. 
and I really, I really am uh, intrigued. I can't wait to see what he brings to spring training this year because I'm, I guarantee you, he spent the whole offseason working on his craft. Mm-hmm. And if he adds a third pitch to go with that fastball and that slider, you know, we're talking the, you're, you're talking about one of the best pitchers, and he's already one of the best pitchers yeah. in the majors. But you're, you're talking about another le- unlocking another level still. Yeah, and he's not just a two-pitch pitcher, but when you have two-plus pitches like this, that's what makes Spencer Strider so good. But if he is able to elevate that changeup and make it just as dangerous, perhaps, as his slider, which is going to be pretty hard to do, and when you've got the elite velocity that he has, it's no surprise that he could be flirting with maybe a 300-strikeout season in 2024. we got to stick a pin in the Spencer Strider discussion because we've got a lot more to talk about here, and that includes Max Fried, who made headlines by agreeing to a new contract for 2024 this past week avoiding that arbitration hearing after two straight years of those, the Braves are going to be paying Freed a $15 million salary for 2024, which is a bargain if he is healthy and back to normal. But as we'll talk about a little bit later with another lefty, Chris, health is awfully important for Max Freed after the season that he just had. Yeah. You know, he three injured list stints uh, last year, which was, you know, a little uncharacteristic. I've seen him labeled this off season as injury prone, but I, I was looking you know, from 19, 2019 to 2022, he appeared 102 games and logged over 572 innings. Mm-hmm. He went to the post. Yes, there has been yeah. a hamstring injury or two thrown in there. Uh, but, you know, up before last season, I mean, he was durable. He took the ball. He took he took it in the big games for the Braves. Mm-hmm. I'm not really worried about it. I'm sure he spent most of the offseason uh, focused. on. Uh, this is obviously a big season for him uh, before he heads into free agency. Mm-hmm. I'm sure he's focused on putting everything together. And, you know, hopefully we get to see the best of Max Freed in 2024. Yeah, and let's not forget, Freed was the runner-up for the NL Cy Young in 2022. He was excellent in those 14 starts last season, was derailed, as you mentioned, by hamstring, and then a forearm issue, which cost him several months. But here's some numbers I found worth noting. You just threw out some about his durability, but a 266 ERA. And again, I know ERA is not all you know the, the end stat to look at, but 83 games started over the past four seasons. That's a very large sample size to post an ERA that good. Eight and a half strikeouts per nine, two walks per nine, and a whip just over one. Max Freed, when he's on, he is as good as any left-hander in the game of baseball. He just turned 30 years old. He is now staring free agency in the face in 2024. If the Braves don't come through with one of those long-term extensions they've been known to sign uh, here over the past couple of years, reason to question whether or not that happens, but there's a big season ahead for the Atlanta lefty and a big decision ahead for the Braves themselves. And this is one, Chris, that I think has a lot of variables and a lot of eyeballs on it. No doubt. I mean, the forearm injury obviously probably gives you a little bit of, of, of pause. Brace said that was a clean injury, was nothing related to the elbow, but you know, that's usually a foreshadowing a little bit. And he's already had one Tommy John sur- surgery. So, you know, if you want to be con- uh, concerned about the, the elbow or the forearm, you know, I understand that. But, you know, again, uh, I just feel like when this guy's right, he's among the best in, in the majors. And I think, he, you know, he showed that obviously with that runner up, Cy Young finish i think he could win a cy young if he if he's able to stay healthy and and start a full season because you know i mean you look at the numbers the thing 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 about max freed is too he he's not necessarily flashy uh but the next thing you know you notice you're out there he's seventh in Mm -hmm. and he's allowed one run and got seven or eight strikeouts you know he's just he's just that kind of uh that kind of pitcher yeah, very efficient when he's on, that's for sure. And meanwhile, a man who's going year to year, like Freed finds himself this particular year, well, that's Charlie Morton, of course. He'll be back again with the Braves in his age 40 season. Morton has been a solid addition, if not better than that, to this staff since signing prior to 2021. He had an up-and-down ride last year, but those numbers, they were there at the end of the year again, and the Braves decided to pick up his $20 million option. Last year, Morton 14-12 and in his 30 starts. 364 ERA, 183 strikeouts, and 163 and a third innings pitched. Obviously, you'll take that line every year, but the real down note for Morton was that finger injury that forced him to miss the National League Division Series, and that ultimately was one of the reasons why I think the Braves went into that series and found this similar outcome to the year before. Yeah, I agree. I think it, it really messed everything up, that along with uh, Max Fried's blister, you know, going into that series. But, you know, as you said, Charlie Morton was statistically better last year than he was in 2022. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a, a when you factor in all the off the stuff, uh, off the fields things that he brings to the clubhouse. I mean, that's a pretty valuable guy. I know $20 million is a lot to, yeah. to, um, to commit, but at the same time, if you looked at this offseason as an example for what pitchers are getting paid, you know, he's almost a little bit of a bargain. I think one of the biggest surprising things for me is his velocity has been just about even 
over all three of his seasons, uh, you know, in Atlanta. Last year was the first trip to the uh, injured list that he's had since he signed with the Braves, not counting, obviously, the world broken leg in the World Series. But, you know, he's been durable. He's, you know, he's taking the ball. The walks are a little bit concerning. The walks, mm-hmm. walk rate really jumped up last year. Yeah. But again, the Braves don't need him to be a top of the rotation guy. They need him to go out there, pitch effectively, give them five or six innings, you know, as a number three or a number four. And, and you know, and that that would be plenty, uh, you know, for this team. Yeah. And with what the Braves have done to this bullpen, you can have a five or six inning starter and not feel like it's a tall task or a big order every single time through the rotation to have this bullpen cover it because they've got the kind of arms that can. If you got Spencer Strider and Max Fried providing innings, which is obviously the, I think, foundation for what this rotation can be, it's great to have a veteran like Charlie Morton. And now from the left side, to have somebody like Chris Sale, someone with his pedigree, and we talked a lot about him on the show a couple of weeks ago, long-running question of the winter, who the Braves could add to their rotation. It was finally answered when they sent Vaughn Grissom to the Red Sox to acquire Sale in that trade. When healthy, as we talked about, he's a frontline, experienced starter. The problem, though, Chris, as we know, has been the health has not been on his side for a variety of reasons over the past five years. All that said, Sale made 20 starts and eclipsed 100 innings for the first time since 2019 last year in Boston. He closed out the season healthy. He's having his first normal offseason in a long time. That's a big deal to me. And he's already at work down in Florida at the Braves Spring Training Complex. So we don't need to recap the trade again or the reasons why the Braves did it. We already know. But the addition of Sale, in my mind, changes the entire dynamic of Atlanta's potential playoff rotation plans if everything works out. And that, as much as anything, is a big reason to take a gamble on somebody like Chris Sale. Yeah, and he's certainly trending in the right direction. You like to see, you know, the 100 innings last year, the 29% strikeout rate was right in line with his career average. You know, the velocity was there. Uh, the normal offseason, I think, is huge. And it was it was interesting to hear him talking about that, you know, how how long it had been since he had really had that opportunity to throw in the offseason. And, um, you know, so I, I agree with you. I mean, this guy's a big game pitcher. I think he's more valuable to a good team like the Braves than he would be a team that may be trying to find out where it fits in in a division, maybe like the Red Sox were. Yeah. You know, he's a competitor. Um, you know, I, I'll take, I would take my chances, uh, you know, if you can line up something, uh, along the lines of Strider freed, and then you've got Chris sale going in game three. I mean, that's a, if he's healthy and right, I, I agree with you. I think it changes the dynamic of the whole rotation. It really does. And with sale on board, it leaves Atlanta to sort out that fifth starter spot. And if that story sounds familiar, well, it should, because we spent most of 2023, if not the last few seasons, trying to figure this thing out. Bryce Elder was an all-star, but as we know, he faded in that second half. I, I think it's pretty obvious he's going to get the first crack at this job, but Ronaldo Lopez, who signed as a free agent, hard thrower, formerly a starter, had a lot of success in the bullpen, mostly with the White Sox. He's also set to get stretched out and get a spot or a shot, really, for a spot uh, in spring training as well. So as, as you get behind that, those two guys, you do find a group that has some high-octane arms like A.J. smith Shaver, Hurston Waldrop, who rose all the way through the Braves minor league system after being taken in the first round of the draft in July. He closed the year in Gwinnett, so he's got to be knocking on the door as well. Then you got a good amount of depth, I feel like, with Darius Vines, Alan Winans. They showed you some stuff last year. Dylan Dodd, it was a little bit rockier for him, but the returns of Waskari Noah and Ian Anderson at some point this year, Enoa in spring training, Anderson maybe around the All-Star break, it's a decent group to work with. But I don't know if I need to tell you that we saw how quickly the Braves can run through that depth if the search for answers goes on for a while or if the aforementioned injuries maybe change their plans. And that's something we know all about, Chris, from recent years. You want to have all this depth because by the time you get to October, which is where the Braves are aiming to get, you just might not, might have needed it all to get exactly where you set your goals. No doubt. I mean, Brian Snicker talks about it all the time. He says we're going to use every one of those guys before it's over, you know, over with. And, I mean, last year was a great example of that. You know, I still think it's a minor miracle that they won 104 games with so little contribution from Max Fried, Kyle Wright. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, they've got a lot of na- names to throw at the problem. And, uh, you know, and I think Bryce Elder, I agree with you. I think he gets the first crack. You know, he kind of overperformed his metrics uh, at, at the, in the first half a little bit. I don't know that he was ever really that good. But at the same time, I think he is a guy that could go out there and give you innings, at, uh, you know, when his command's right. I don't think the plan was ever for him to throw 170 innings. Uh, sure. You know, and that was just out of necessity. Um, so he wore down in the second half, he, you know, I mean, he'd never thrown that many, uh, innings in his, in his career pro short pro career. So, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be interesting, but you know, I'm intrigued. I mean, they had guys like Alan Winans, as you mentioned, uh, Darius Fines, those guys came in through some quality innings. Uh, you know, you figure they're going to spend a lot of time at Gwinnett getting ready. 
I think the Braves have some depth there, um, and maybe even more so than they had last year. Yeah, and when we saw last year coming to spring training, that depth it, very quickly, pieces of it were taken away, whether it was Ian Anderson not being able to perform, then having to have Tommy John surgery. You already didn't have Waskar Noah. Kyle Wright, who's been traded to the Kansas City Royals. I didn't have that on my bingo card when the Braves were reporting to spring training a year ago, but a shoulder injury kept him on the sidelines. He won't pitch at all in 2024 for his new team either. So very quickly, the Braves were not trying to figure out who's going to be the fifth starter. They were trying to figure out a lot of times who's going to be the fourth and fifth, and sometimes the third, fourth, and fifth. So I'm sure that they would like to have some of these questions work themselves out with a little bit more consistency this year than they did a season ago. I do want to touch one more time on Ian Anderson because I feel like he's going to become or has become a little bit of a forgotten man. He struggled in 2022. The injury last year, Tommy John surgery, his throwing program is progressing. Alex Anthopoulos said around June, I think, is about the time he'll really ramp up the rehab assignment. That will take about a month or so. Ian Anderson has been one of the Braves' best pitchers in their postseason run in recent years. If he's healthy and finally has himself moving in the right direction, that could be a pretty important bonus to have in your rotational depth in that second half, just based on what he was able to accomplish his first couple of years in the big leagues. Yeah, I think a lot of people forget how good he was in 2020, especially in the postseason. And then, you know, the first half of 2021, he was pretty yeah. good, you know, before the shoulder injury right there around the All-Star break, you know, and he's kind of been searching for it ever since. I do think, uh, you know, that's a big arm to have. I mean, in a perfect world, uh, you know, once, once Ian's ready to return, hopefully you don't need him. You know, hopefully you're not in that situation where he's got to come up and make uh, pitch big innings because, you know, you've had so many other injuries or underperformance in the rotation. But, man, you know, if he can if he can just get some time at Gwinnett and pitch his way back into the into the picture, then you're talking about a, you know, a good starting rotation right now that gets even better. Um, so yeah. I'm anxious to see what he looks like, because I just really don't think he's ever right again after that. um you know, after that shoulder injury in 2021. Yeah, and clearly the elbow was a big problem for him a year ago. So if he's able to sort all those things out, it can take time after Tommy John. I know I've talked to a lot of different pitchers, including Kirby Yates a year ago, who basically said it takes time more so than getting my velocity back is getting my command back and being able to locate the way that I'm used to locating. Ian Anderson will also have to cross that bridge in his return. But the Braves have a rotation that has the kind of depth that you want to as they head towards spring training in about a month from now. And while the rotation was a big question mark in the postseason and a big topic of discussion this winter to see how they were going to address it, the bullpen is one area the Braves have really keyed in on this or since October. And we're going to preview the arms that are in charge of turning those leads into wins when we take a look at the Atlanta relievers next week. That's going to do it for this edition of Battery Power TV. Make sure that you like, share, and subscribe to the channel as we count down to spring training. We look forward to catching you next time, this time next week, as a matter of fact. So go ahead and turn on those alerts so you get notified every time we drop a new episode. For Chris Rillis, I'm Grant McCauley. We will catch you next time. And until then, Braves country, so long.